Hello, my name is David Stocker, and if you would, please lend me the next few minutes of your time to talk about possible solutions to climate change. If you don't have the time right now, there's a shorter version of this video. Its link is posted down below. Take a look at it, and when you get the time, come back for the full discussion. We need to dramatically bring down CO2 emissions, and we need to do it in short order, within a decade or two. The traditional quote-unquote progressive and conservative solutions to climate change are both inadequate. On the progressive side of the house, you usually have things like more energy efficiency, which is always good, more efficiency is always good, and using less. On the conservative side, the problem is that the answer is, well, it's a market solution. It's a market solution. The government can't dictate winners. The only tool you have is a hammer. Every problem looks like a nail. So my solution is this. It's a two-pronged approach. Number one, we need a Manhattan project for massive energy infrastructure project. Things like smart grids so that we can transport electricity from one part of the country to another easily and reliably on demand. Increased fusion research. We have been 30 years from commercial fusion for the last 60 years. And the main reason for that is we just haven't invested enough. It's one of these things that requires a massive, massive public investiture. And it's not going to happen without the public. But if we make that investment and we make that push, it'll pay off in terms of clean, cheap energy forever. The second prong is a large, publicly backed venture capital fund for the kinds of high capital, clean energy startups that private venture capital just can't handle. In order to get from a fossil fuel based economy to a clean energy based economy, we're going to need what's known as disruptive innovation. There are two kinds of innovation. Sustaining innovation is a better mousetrap. And it's the kind of innovation that we're most familiar with. Every year, our phones get a little better, our cars get a little better. The other kind of innovation is what's known as disruptive innovation. And disruptive innovation is something that comes along and upsets the apple cart. Prime examples are Uber, what Uber has done to the taxi business, what Airbnb is doing to the hotel business, what Amazon did to brick and mortar bookstores in the 90s and early 2000s. These are classic examples of disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovation is not always just new technology. It's also new business models. We need disruptive innovation, but there's a problem with disruptive innovation. It's very, very hard, and it's very, very risky. And it's nearly always only done by startups. And there's a reason for this. Harvard professor Clayton Christiansen calls this the innovator's dilemma. And the problem is, is if you're a successful incumbent firm and you have customers, you're going to listen to your customers. How can you better serve them and build the next generation of your product or your service and make it better and make your customers more happy? The problem there is that your customers think in terms of the current solution. They're not interested in something that upends the apple cart. And this is what makes it very risky to carry out. If you're a large publicly traded company and you're expected to have a certain degree of profit margin every single quarter, okay, whether it's 5% in your industry, 10% typical for your industry, 30%, it varies from industry to industry, but you're typically expected to carry a certain profit margin, sinking lots of money into these disruptive gambles is not conducive to meeting your quarterly numbers. So for this reason, most disruptive innovations are not made by large incumbent companies. Incumbent fossil fuel companies in the energy space are not just dealing with their current customers and not just dealing with Wall Street's expectations on their quarterly numbers. They're also sitting on about $6 trillion altogether of capital investment. Their balance sheets are enormous. These three things together trap them into their current model. We can't expect the incumbents in the energy space to be the ones driving the clean energy disruption. They simply can't do this.
We're going to need new players. We're going to need startups. Where are the startups? We do have clean energy startups, but there aren't that many of them. Most venture capital is sunk into software. And there's a reason for that too. Startups get funded mostly by venture capital. And your typical angel investor, for example, funding a startup very early on is expecting a 1500% return. Because a 1500% return is what you need in order to turn a profit when you're expecting that nine out of the 10 companies you fund are going to fail. Software is cheap. There's almost zero capital investment in software. My kids could found a software startup tomorrow. So if you're a venture capital fund, you're an angel investor, you can sink $200,000 into that startup over there and another 200,000 into that startup over there. And these guys are doing pizza delivery by drone. It might be the next big thing. Software startups are cheap. The problem with clean energy startups is remember the $6 trillion worth of energy infrastructure? Energy has a high capital investment. A funding model that works for small software companies that just want to push cat videos to your phone every day fails when you have to invest large amounts of capital, the kinds that these new clean energy companies need. What if your business model is batteries at service stations for electric cars and they just pull in, swap the battery and go like you're tanking up gas? That requires capital investment. A little bit more money than $200,000 to push cat videos around the internet. And that's the problem. So how can we change this? Traditional venture capital can't handle this. If these startups are so expensive, when these bets get too big, the willingness of, on the part of venture capitalists to take them, or the ability to take them, goes way down. If I fund 10 different startups expecting one of them to succeed, I could do this with a million bucks. But if I have to fund startups that require a big fat balance sheet just to get started, that's maybe a little too much risk. And that's the problem. It's too expensive, it's too risky. So in comes a public fund. You set aside a pool of money into a publicly backed venture capital fund. And then we invite experienced venture capitalists to come and administer it for the public. They pick the companies. Then if you have an idea for a clean energy startup, you can go to this fund and you can pitch your idea to them. We use all the normal criteria for funding a new startup along with the clause that it must be clean energy. So these companies get funded. Of course, we expect nine out of 10 to fail, but the 10% that do succeed, if we're expecting a 1500% return, that means that the public is actually gonna be making a profit on this. So it's a win-win for the public. We get our transformation to clean energy. We can head off the worst of climate change, and the public can make a profit while we're at it. And that's it. That's the magic recipe. A large, publicly backed venture capital fund for all those would-be dead dinosaur killers. Thank you for watching. If you liked this, please share it on social media, tweet it, retweet it, but most of all, thank you for watching.